I'm just repeating a little bit of this instruction since I didn't have the recording on. And sharing the instructions. It'll take a few minutes to tune into your internal world through following the movement of breath, the support of gravity and the spaciousness of space. Gravity on the exhale, space on the And when you get ready, let your eyes drift open. And when you feel ready, uh, somebody would like to share. I just want to say a few things for me. Um, I really feel grateful that I have the skills to be able to offer um, these skills in my years of study around breathing to, for all of us now, to find ways to take care of ourselves in this current atmosphere of the virus and all other pollutions. And the biggest issue for me has come to the issue of trust. I started to really tune into how angry I am that I can't trust the water, the food, or the air supply to keep me healthy. And the uh, deep sorrow and loss of the people who are being hurt by it, as well as the fact that the planet doesn't feel safe at the moment. Our home is deteriorating. So I'd like to hear from some of you as a way of kind of getting in connection. And, um, and then we'll go on and I'll give the skills and do the PowerPoint and talk about what I have to offer. So if you want to speak, please unmute yourself. It'd be nice to hear from a few of you before we get started in this other way. Well, I'll just say hello. This is Corey. Hey, Corey. It's delightful to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I've got to run in about 20 minutes or a half an hour, but I wanted to just, just take in some of this vibe. And I'm already appreciative of the word buoyant and uh, just always found any interaction with you about breath to be quite uh, delightful. So thank you. Thanks for letting me be here. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate you coming on. Hi, Robert. It's nice to see you again. It's been many years. Um, Hi, Robert. So... I have been in an asthma state or something for about a week now, and I have been self-isolating with my daughter here because um, I'm not breathing well, and even with nebulizer, and um, I resorted to Advair. I'm trying to stay off the prednisone because of the immune-lowering stuff, but I'm still really tight, and um, it's scary. So For sure. Well, some of the things will be reminders for you today. And also, when did you start your Advair? Ah, you froze, Rebecca. I started the Advair about a days ago, but I've been doing either my inhaler or mostly NEB treatments once to twice a day for really since about last Thursday. Okay. And it's not really, the Advair has helped, you know, a little bit, um, but I'm not turning a corner and um, that's freaking me out. Okay. Appreciate that. And if some things don't get healed for you here, let's talk a one to one after this. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good to know that. Thank you. All right. Anybody else want to chime in? I just want to say hi to everyone. Thank you for offering this. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about trust. Great. Who is speaking? You mentioned, like, although I feel like I. Jennifer. Oh, okay, Jen. 
Jennifer. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So about trust that I appreciate that you said that we can't trust the outside, but I feel like I can trust my body mm -hmm. to be able to protect itself. And that I feel very grateful to feel that inside of me right now. That's what I say. All right. I, I really appreciate hearing that, Jennifer, because really, I think that that's the best shot we have is to know how to use our bodies and how to be with our bodies so that they can really do the best job that they possibly can. We're, we're, I think we're being invited into an evolutionary development in terms of our own biological processes and our own immune system. And so to give it the best chance possible, which is some of these skills that I'm offering for the body to integrate, assimilate as best we can and find a way to combat the virus itself. So thank you. I trust my body. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, this is Laura. Hey, Laura. From Berkeley, California. And uh, I'm here with my, on this class with my 85 year old mother who is at high risk for the virus. And we've talked um, together how, you know, this, this could be a critical moment for her. And um, I think I was feeling my heart more around that today. You know, it's been kind of intellectual and um, just a lot of firefighting going on in the world in terms of how to logistically manage things. And I was just feeling it in my heart. Love you, mom. <laughs> you, yeah, it gets personal, it gets serious real fast. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm the daughter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and I live in a, a, a retirement center, and we're on total lockdown. You know, no, no people coming in, going out, and they're doing our best to protect us. But it's a really unsettling time. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot of sadness about what's going on so and do you have good friends there that you at least can be with while you're there and nobody can yeah but we're supposed to you know maintain at least a six foot distance you know and not a lot of gatherings so we're you know it's a it's a hard time i think for everybody yeah i do notice myself even though it's supposed to be isolating i do there's a commonality of concern that has me engaging with people when I take a walk. Maybe we stay a little right. away from. Oh them. yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. that's a useful thing. We need the we need the we need the connection. We can't. Oh, we uh, really do. <laughs> that would really shred our nervous system to feel completely isolated and alone all the time, in our in our immune system. And my daughter's tremendous support. <laughs> you go, Laura. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Okay. All right, I'm gonna uh, share the screen and get, um, start working with um, my slide, pre slide presentation and conversations. Okay, if you'd mute yourself again, uh, that would be great. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, can everybody can everybody see the uh, slide? No, not yet. Okay. Really, slides not up on the screen, huh? How about now? Not yet. How about uh, we, now? we can see your. Um, well, back back to you. Okay, let me stop the sharing. I'll start sharing again. Okay. Now? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, hopefully that was useful. I think that's the simplest way for me to think about turning into breathing is, the, is the, uh, just to follow the movement. As soon as I'm in touch with some biological process, I feel like I come out of my mind, and come into my body a little bit. And I really appreciate the support of gravity uh, and, <laughs> and the spaciousness of air. 
So I just wanted, you know, I know it's now it's been a week or two weeks since a lot of this information uh, came out at first, but there's been a lot more articles by people who are literary and are concerned with bodies and psyche about, you know, some of the other things that are happening around um, the virus, what it's stimulating in other avenues. And since I've, you know, been writing about and researching and seeing that 91% of the world's population doesn't have clean air to breathe, that's a heartbreaking number. And some of you have heard me speak to that. Um, and even in the United States, you can't go to a national park. There's no healthy air left in the national parks. Uh, so this was a satellite image, just to point out um, what happened when the virus came and decided that um, fossil fuel emissions were no longer, uh, no longer necessary for the planet and other forms of survival had to uh, take place. So uh, no air pollution over China, except a little bit in Beijing and some of the other bigger cities, but it completely cleared up when the cars went off the road and when um, the factories stopped producing. Um, uh, and amazing, amazing that you know, people who never have weren't able to breathe for decades are all of a sudden finding out, yes, they're worried about the virus, but on the other hand, we don't have to wear masks because we can't smoke because of too much smoke in the air. So um, that's kind of an amazing thing. And I was also happy to see this particular um, result also that the cruise ships are off the, off the seas. Um, and most of these cruise ships have now shut down. And I don't think the statistic is well known. I should, they certainly don't popularize it, which is every day one cruise ship puts out the equivalent of 1 million cars on the road, the equivalent of the uh, emissions of 1 million cars on the road. One cruise ship, one day. And we don't even know how many there are. I don't. Uh, and the other incredible statistic, there's a resource at the bottom of the slideshow, which you'll get tomorrow along with the link of the, of the article that has all this information, which I think is really well written uh, with videos and the, I'm talking about the 1 billion gallons of sewage every year that, they, that the cruise ships put into the ocean. It's just you know, incredible disaster. So like I said, um, and 91% of the world's population doesn't have clean air to breathe. And right now, the number has climbed from 7 uh, million people a year to close to 9 million people a year are dying from uh, air pollution. So th there was an article recently written that air pollution is the pandemic, is one of the pandemics. It's not the only, virus is not the only pandemic that we have going on, but every year. And the reason I say that as far as we know is because there are people who never get to the hospital. You know, these are people, 72% are dying from heart attack and stroke, and 18% dying from a respiratory compromise, and half of that figure is from asthma, and half of that figure is from uh, lung cancer. So um, really, the most, the ser most serious um, biological process we have is our heart and our brain that's affected by uh, pollution. More people die from heart attack and stroke than from uh, respiratory disease, which I find outstanding. So right now we know that the common symptoms in the infection are respiratory symptoms, in other words, breathlessness, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, pain in breathing, high fever, hacking cough, heavy chest, and it can turn into pneumonia and severe respiratory syndrome, and kidney failure, and that's what people die from is the fluid-filled lungs where they can't get, get to breath, a horrible way to die. But, um, and what we know is we wash our hands frequently at least 20, seconds at a time, you know, two happy birthdays, or how many people are doing that? I noticed for the first time, I mean, I'm washing my hands like crazy. I notice, um, wow, I really like having clean hands. It's almost like I'm obsessive about clean hands <laughs> now. And I didn't realize how much petting my dog, and I don't even let people pet my dog on the street anymore. Um, you know, how much really gets picked up in the debris that I didn't even realize. So I'm really appreciating washing my hands. You probably heard this, you know, make your own sanitizer if you can't get them. Um, people are sitting with huge stockpiles. It was in the New York Times this morning, 20,000 bottles of, of hand sanitizers, people all over the world, because they were gouging, price gouging for $120 a bottle, and so that Amazon cut them off. So this, there's stuff out there, it's not available. And sneezing and coughing into your sleeve at the end of the day. There was a report, I don't know if some of you may have listened to Amy Goodman yesterday in Good Morning America. She had her brother on and another epidemiologist. And they were talking about that they're now noticing that when, it's, when, the, when somebody's breath is aerosolized, like in an asthma treatment, nebulizer, Rebecca, and the breath that's coming out of there is, is sort of fine particles that the virus will live for three hours in the air before dropping to the ground and dispersing. 
So we don't know yet whether that's going to get any further. I particularly think a sneeze is an aerosolization, aerosolization. And so I'm a little cautious about the air. So that's what makes me a little less trusting. Um, so we'll see if they come up with, they speak to that a little later, but certainly it gets transmitted through the air and then it drops to the surfaces. So let's be careful what we're walking into. And they say, stay six feet away, quarantine yourself for 14 days. I was thinking about the testing and I know everybody can't get testing, but if you're sick, Stay home, if we, even if you can't get the test, right? Until you get cleared up. Um, and you want to stop, you know, we want to do things to strengthen the immune system. So all the things that I'm going to teach today are all about that. They're all about how do we treat our immune system in a way that it can at least have the best chance to deal with one thing and one thing only. So if we can, yeah, go ahead, Francis. Robert, has anybody, something I've been wondering about is, uh, cloth, you know, there's a lot about wiping down counters and stuff. Yeah. But has has anybody here found out or heard whether just running clothes through the washing machine in a regular cycle actually does anything in terms of getting rid of the virus? If it's, you know, somebody's kind of sneezed at you or your hand is brushed, your arm is brushed against something? Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to say I think it does, uh, Francis, because if you wash your hands for 20 seconds and you've got your laundry in hot water, with the soap for longer than 20 seconds. And I use mostly all the time in my laundry, I use uh, seventh generation uh, non-chlorinated bleach. So mm -hmm. I put a little bleach in the laundry as well. So I'm, I'm gonna think that it really does. Make okay. <laughs> Anybody else wanna say it? I guess I'm seeing some heads bobbing in response. So um, that's the logic for me, Francis. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, virus can be, what we also need to know is what we're discovering is, hello? Um, is that it's also can be, it's, you know, depending how close you are. I mean, we, we breathe out water vapor all the time. I mean, it's gonna be, gotta be in the water vapor of breath. Um, Nose breathing and respiratory, I just wanna see if somebody signed out. I look away, not because I'm looking away from you, but I have two screens. So I'm reading off the screen to the right of me. So uh, please forgive that uh, loss of eye contact. Nose breathing and respiratory system is our first defense. So the virus we know replicates in the lungs. Its membrane goes into the lung membrane, merges with the lung, brain, lung cell membranes and breaks them down. And inside the, inside the cell, the virus membrane, which is lipid soluble, breaks away and the virus hooks into, gets replicated by our DNA. And as it keeps getting replicated, it fills out into the lung tissue and breaks down regular lung tissue and um, creates a tremendous amount of debris and replicates and causes more illness. So the immune system is going to go on high alert to do it best it can to ameliorate that uh, proliferation of the virus itself. So one of the things that we, we, we need to know, and I think we speak and hear about it in the media, is that when the immune system goes on high alert, it, uh, it, it can get overactive and it can begin to destroy healthy tissue. And one of the things that makes it overactive is fear and anxiety. Uh, it triggers the autonomic nervous system to say there's a threat in the environment. And so when there's a threat in the environment, one of the functions of the body is to kick into high gear the immune system to, just like if you were to defecate from a big fear or urinate, um, it's just trying to make the body lighter and quicker and easier for uh, fighting and flighting. But long-term, and this will come up later in the slides, long-term fear and anxiety just keeps that nervous system and the immune system over by Corey, overactive, and um, that overactive is killing uh, regular cells that can be used for our immune system and also creating way too much debris in the system that clogs up the system. And that's where pneumonia can develop and other ways that oxygen cannot be transferred from the uh, lungs to the blood. Most of the time, there's really not much problem with getting the oxygen that we breathe in from the lungs to the blood but any kind of lining in the lung, any more water, any infection, any inflammation in the lung starts to prevent the flow of oxygen from the lung to the blood. And that's where the body gets in real big trouble by not having enough oxygen. 
the way we breathe also determines some of that, which we'll go over soon. So that's why for me, breathing is the most, one of the most important defenses we have right now, is that if we're using our breath correctly, at least we're not triggering the fight or flight, at least we're not overacting our immune system so it can deal with just the thing that is invading it. It doesn't have to do with the pollution. It can kind of take care of itself with a little less um, stimulus from the outside environment when we're breathing well. And the other thing that I'm going to speak to that's up on the slide is the immune system is not a separate biological function from the rest of the body. We are an immune system. We are a breath. We are a heartbeat. We are all of it. It's all one whole unit. Nothing is independent of the other. And so how one thing affects one thing, it affects everything. That makes sense to everybody, doesn't it? And so for us, for me, the nose is the number one protection that we can put into place. So the common phrase, of course, is the nose is for breathing and the mouth is for eating. And some people like this and some people don't, but it's good. And, the, and breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. It's a way of remembering that particular idea. The nose is for breathing, the mouth is for eating. You breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. So. Yes, all right. So I've been thinking about this, I've been doing this some. Um, you know, one of the things that cued me onto this that was really important uh, was um, some video I saw about uh, pollution in India, which is of course one of the highest polluted countries in the world. And, they designed some uh, nasal filters that people put in their nostrils, little filters, and walk around with them all day rather than masks. And after a couple of hours, they're black. So um, the truth is, so is our nose. Our nose is doing the filtering. It filters really well. It filters 0.5 microns and above, which are most pollutants, except for smoke and unfortunately the virus. So our noses get dirty. So it'd be a good idea to keep them clean. You know, if you've been outside, come back in, Use a nasal wash. This is one that you can get in the store. This is a nice kit. It has packets in it that have uh, non-iodized non salt as well as um, baking, I think it's baking powder, baking soda to help uh, take away the burn of the salt. And so you put little packets in or you can make your own with just a little baking soda and a little non-iodized salt. And this is just a squeeze bottle. And this is the traditional Indian Ayurvedic way of a neti pot that you can fill with that with that um, mixture and then pour it in one and out the other to keep your nose clean. Harder to do when your nose is really stuffed, it really doesn't work well. So the nasal wash here is better to help get it open because the other has a little pressure. The other, it just won't flow if the nose is stuffed. So here I'm saying it, uh, the nose filters particles five microns and above, that's really small. So like when there's um, any kind of pollutants, all those people with 91% um, can don't have clean air to breathe. Most of it, if they're using their nose for breathing, is getting filtered. Uh, anything smaller than that are smoke and viruses. But um, so very useful to do that, to keep nose breathing. Um, the other things that it does, um, it controls the temperature of the air to the lungs. So the lungs only like 98.6 degree temperature, body temperature. Lungs like body temperature air. So when we breathe through our nose, it goes through all the sinuses, and all our sinuses are fully invaginated with blood vessels everywhere. And blood is the way that our body controls the temperature of our body. So it has a great ability, water has a great ability, blood, to absorb heat and to disperse heat. So when air comes in, if it's too cold, then the blood will warm the air before it goes down into the lungs. So the lungs don't have to stress about you know, getting contracted because it's too cold and not the right temperature. Or if you're in a hot climate, it will absorb some of that heat back into the blood and disperse it out through the skin. So it's watching the temperature for the lungs. It regulates the humidity. That's why hydration is really important right now to keep the mucous membranes really moist. You know, for anybody who read the body's many cries for water, the recommendation there was half your body weight in ounces per day, no more than 15, no more than eight ounces in 15 minutes. Body can't absorb more than that, so there's no point in drinking a liter down really fast. And so mucous membranes in our lungs, in our nose, and our throat particularly, it helps us cough it out when it needs to, the debris cough it out, or we swallow it and the hydrochloric acid in our body will uh, uh, destroy what's in there. So uh, keep moist. And some people say they're upping their water intake now. 
some of the caveats are about water intake, of course, as you make sure that you're um, urinating out as much as you're um, drinking in. You know, most people aren't going to measure, but you know if your urination starts to slow down, you have to be careful because you're adding more water to your blood volume and uh, it could increase your blood pressure with too much blood volume. So you have to be careful of that if you're at risk in that way. The nose produces antibacterial molecules, which are great um, for killing bacteria. Bacteria comes into the nose, it'll be um, discharged by the antibacterial molecules in the nose. Breathe through your mouth, right into the lungs. Um, and it helps regulate the gas exchange. Um, There's a little further, more conversation, which we'll get to later. Um, and nose breathing releases nitric oxide and carbon dioxide, which also helps open the blood vessels and airways. It helps them dilate. So Rebecca, that's really important for you. The more you nose breathe, you know, almost, almost for you right now, you shouldn't be talking or using your mouth, only just for eating. You know, you could even tape your mouth with, um, with paper tape and just be quiet in your nose all the time. It's, it's with, with asthma, it doesn't take but one breath, dig through the mouth to kick off that response in the body that, oh my God, we're not going to be able to breathe, which is, of course, incredibly scary. And I do think, um, this is my own personal opinion, there's no proof on this, but I, what I said earlier, by presenting, the, by presenting the virus to our nose first and not directly into our lungs, this, I mean, we have this nose for a reason. There's going to be something going on. There's going to be signals sent throughout the body from the nose that something's here that needs to be dealt with. And um, at least it gives it one step more interference before it goes directly into the lungs for the body to innovate some kind of response to it that may keep us you know, healthy and alive. So for me, just my own way of thinking, break, breathing is a sacred gift deserving honor, caring, tenderness, and grace. It's just, it is, it's our life force. It touches us on the inside and offering potential for comfort. And it is the one thing that every species on this planet does. We are all doing the same thing. It's a unifying reality of belonging. We all share the air. And James Lovelock and Gaia Theory wrote about it. We create this atmosphere. We create it with our breath. We create it with the way we use our emissions. We make it. It's ours. So let's make it the way it was. That's what, how it got formed in the first place. It's bacteria that formed that, um, that oxygen in our air. And, you know, on your own, we're not going to go too much in today, but I do like to make a point for that there are no two breaths alike. Every breath is different, so it's an opportunity to see what's going on now, 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 even in the nanoseconds of the inhale and the exhale, everything is new moment to moment to moment. It's a creation, a manifestation. And when we finish our exhale, the truth being, we don't know if we'll get another breath. We never know. It's, it comes in, it's a gift. Thank you. We have arrived again into creation. So it's a fractal of our life and death from the first breath we take in to the last breath we give out. So for me, I'm working with trying to get comfortable with that truth because the greatest fear for me of the virus, of course, is that I lose my life. And if I can hold my life in a little more lighter place in the reality of this uh, tenuousness and uh, that it comes and goes on each breath, maybe I'll have an easier time if something more serious happens to me. I don't know. Push comes to shove, we'll know the truth there. All right, so the nose knows. These are two pictures of the nose for those who are interested in what the nose looks like. The top picture is one without the nose. It's at the base of the nose where the turbinates live. And those are the turbinates you see there. And the turbinates do, the, do to the air what you see in the bottom picture. It spirals the air. So every, it's, not a, it's not a linear design, our breath, just like we see in, when we see trees and leaves blow. They don't blow in any this direction. They're just dancing. So our lungs are dancing with the spiral of our own breath. So I see some of you closing your eyes. It's a good way to feel into that, to really feel that our whole body's movement never is really linear. We sway, we rock, we move. And that's set up by the breath. It's set up by the spiraling and the movement of the breath. And that spiral in geosacred geometry carries more information than any other shape in nature. So um, we see it replicated in all kinds of plant growth. We are the same. 
So um, it supports the immune system. Um, so, so here's this, what we need to know is that oxygen, it is a primary nutrient. It is the most primary nutrient. It comes before water, it comes before food. You will get a copy of these slides, don't worry. Um, and so what, what is the function of it? It comes to the cells, it comes to the mitochondria. And those little mitochondria, we wanna, we wanna be really grateful for them. They're like three billion years old, right? And they were around and they were part of the anaerobic bacteria kingdom which before oxygen, when there was only sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide in the air. And they metabolized that really well and they outgassed oxygen. They just kind of farted oxygen all over the place, those little anaerobic, anaerobic bacteria. And they polluted the environment with oxygen. And so 98% of what was alive at that time died. All the anaerobic bacteria just died. They just went, secluded themselves at the bottom of the ocean where the volcanic jets are. And um, those little mitochondria are the precursor of those bacteria that learned how to metabolize oxygen. And so that's what we have in our body, those early bacteria that metabolize oxygen and outgas carbon dioxide uh, for, uh, for also for our own health. And so when it gets to those mitochondria, those mitochondria are producing the energy that runs our body. That's where we get our energy in the form of ATP. And so for every molecule of oxygen, we get 38 molecules of ATP. The numbers are astronomical. We can't even count the numbers of what we're producing. So when a body is fully oxygenated and manufacturing the full complement of energy, then the immune system has a chance. If we are not breathing well, and we are uh, not able to distribute as much oxygen to, from our blood to our cells, and then we are reducing our energy production and making our immune systems having to work hard. And so part of what happens, we just wanna get this one particular idea across, I do, is that um, oxygen, excuse me, carbon dioxide regulates the distribution of oxygen from the blood to the cells. And the way that we maintain a balance of carbon dioxide in our system is through nose breathing. If we use our mouth for breathing, especially in the exhale too much, we give off too much of that carbon dioxide. It changes our uh, pH in our blood and reduces the availability of oxygen to leave the blood to go to the cells to make energy. And so the cells go on a backup production of making only eight molecules of energy for every molecule of carbon di car carbohydrate that they usually combine with oxygen instead of 38. So we go into fatigue and loss of energy right away. And that's a real severe stress on the body to have the cells of our body be in starvation for their major nutrient. It makes everything else much more difficult for us to handle. Okay, questions on that before I go on? It's a lot of uh, information. Has anybody got any questions? Take a break for a moment. I'm gonna do some breathing pieces in a minute. But so yeah, I just wanted to say I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes. Sure, Francis. Sorry. That's all right, please. Go ahead. Oh, you have to leave. Okay. Sorry to see you go. Anybody else have a question about any of that? It's a lot of technical information. It comes out of my the take a world. Go ahead, Lori. Why don't you unmute yourself? Can you unmute yourself, Lori, or I'll unmute you? Let's see if that works. Please, go well, ahead. um, I'm Lori Berg, and I've actually studied with Robert Buteco breathing, retraining, and um, this information, and I find it so valuable, and I use it with my clients. I'm not teaching Buteco, but all of this is so helpful, and Good. so now just to study with you again and get the details again is so helpful, you know, Great. for myself. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. Good to hear your voice and see you again. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll mute you back up. Good. Just want to give everybody a chance if they want to ask a question. Hey, Susanna. Doing okay here? Another Bottega teacher online. <laughs> She's shaking her head and smiling, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, so here's my concern. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. The extended periods of anxiety and fear are just devastating to the system. They just, and it's really hard not to be that way right now. And I think that's why I'm, I, I know that's why I measured, mentioned the issue of trust, you know, uh, trust in the air. Now, we're, now we can't trust people next to us. So whether it's up to conscious level or not, you got to recognize that underneath somewhere in the psyche and the body, when there's no trust, 
then um, we shut down, we contract, we pull into ourselves, we make ourselves like a sea urchin, we make ourselves less permeable, our skin gets tighter, or we can't expand our lungs as much. We body says, well, we can't, the environment's not safe, we can't breathe it, we have to be more careful, to be quieter, so, or we panic and overdo it, everything. So um, this is really a, a a critical thing to pay attention to. Where are you being affected by the fact that you feel like you're not trusting your atmosphere and your work and your uh, environment? So an over, overacting immune response destroys healthy tissue and creating a lot of debris that clogs up the body. You get reduced oxygen delivery by unbalancing the blood gases. Carbon dioxide regulates the oxygen flow from the blood to the cells. And so when it's not flowing, it's a decrease in energy. When you're in fight or flight, digestion is a non-essential function. Body says, not now. Shuts it down completely. No peristalsis. And so oftentimes when you relax and you hear your stomach gurgle, people can misinterpret. They, oh, I'm hungry. No, that's digestion coming back online. Uh, so fight or flight, no digestion. Rapid heart rate, trying to get more blood around, feed the system. You're in fight or flight, so your heart rate's going to be escalated. But at the same time, blood flow where in the skin, excuse me, in the skin where usually there's a lot of reservoirs is going to move away from the surface of the skin, come into the body to feed the muscles and the organs. So because they're more essential than the, than the surface. And if you got nicked or hurt or, or scratched on the surface, you wouldn't bleed to death because there's less blood up there right now. Hopefully that would be the case. You have tunnel vision when you're in fight or flight. In other words, you can't enjoy the periphery of you. You're not interested in what's going on around you as much as you are of what's in right in front of you. And unfortunately, and you can practice this little piece right now, if you open up to your periphery and your peripheral vision, you may notice that you get a sense internal of a little bit more belonging. Our sense of belonging lives in the periphery. And so we can feel ourselves as part of a larger whole. When we're straight in front and everything's just right in front of us, we lose that. We can get in our heads and get too isolated inside of ourselves and have a feeling of isolation. So remembering to open up that peripheral vision. Uh, we can over, over sweat with too much fear to, because the purpose of that is to cool the body. And of course, obsessive and repetitive thoughts. And part of from my, in my Patego experience, the obsessive and repetitive thoughts come from one way of thinking about it. The brain doesn't feel pain but it's sending up a lot of messages. We're in trouble here. So we're trying to get your attention by sending the same thoughts up over and over and over again. Start to breathe well, start to quiet down your nervous system. You'll notice your focus is on your body. It's like, oh, okay, remember what I was thinking. Opening up your senses, your hearing, your seeing, there's space around you, there's birds chirping. Much more interesting than those repetitive thoughts. You're not going to solve them from being thinking about how I solve them. Thoughts you have to be in your body to know what to do. So, uh, if anybody has anything to say, please raise your hand. I'm going to go on to exercises for calming the anxiety and stress. So, I want to give this particular exercise. I'm going to just demonstrate it rather than read it. The first thing we need to know if you got a stuffed nose is how to clear your nose. And so, you want to keep nose breathing even if you are um, stuffy, not feeling well, whether you have a common cold, anytime, you know, over breathe through your mouth and your nose starts to stuff, that's one of the things that happens. So I'm gonna move away from my chair a little bit. This is a really simple exercise. You can do it, most people who are healthy can do it until you feel a slight urge to breathe, tender slight urge to breathe. If you feel like you have any other kind of compromise then you wanna just do it for three to six times. So you begin to just bob your head up and down. You breathe, bob. I'll do it for you, then we'll do it together. You breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Pinch my nose at the end of the exhale, bob my head until I feel a slight urge to breathe for six times. Make sure my mouth stays closed when I finish. And breathe as if you are smelling a rose. You can even put an imaginary rose up there so tenderly because you're letting the nose have a chance to find a small stream of air that will come in and unblock it, as well as the carbon dioxide is going to let yourself um, open up as a dilator. It'll help open the nose. An alternative is, is to just move your feet 
if your neck is compromised or walk back and forth. So let's do it together. So bend, as you breathe in slowly, if you have to use your mouth, if you're so stuffed, then do that. Out, in, out, pinch your nose, out your head. And you breathe like you're smelling a rose. Feel better? <laughs> Some smiles. You know, we breathe through one nostril. We, one nostril is always dominant, uh, right and left. It switches every 20 to 90 minutes because it tunes the nose breathing on the right nostril, tunes the electricity in the left hemisphere of the brain and vice versa. And so alternate nostril breathing in yoga is to get both nose and nostrils open to tune, and so nose clearing can help open a nostril that may not be dominant at that particular moment to get more air. So, any questions on that exercise? It's really a great one. I came back from Sweden once with a cold. I was doing the 35 minutes on the plane, the people must have thought I was crazy, but I was new into the potato world, and I thought, I'm not breathing through my mouth, no way. And uh, but I, was like, I was like 15 hours bumping <laughs> my head. <laughs> Okay, so this is really important. I find this to be just one of the best little exercises on the planet. Um, I'm a movement teacher as well. Some of you know that I continue a movement teacher. So I'm real tuned to where I'm breathing from and what's happening and how my body is uh, functioning in breath. And so it came to me after uh, teaching Boteco for quite a number of years and having my own times when I'm not feeling well or um, I yawn or I sigh. I see that those activities, the coughing, sighing, yawning, and uh, sneezing, they're all the energy that we're, to sneeze and to cough and to sigh, they're all coming up in this direction. It's all energy that moves up towards the head. One time, not a problem, but if we're sick and we're sneezing all the time and we're coughing all the time, everything is coming up towards the head. We get stuck there and we start to breathe from our chest. And that's going to be the slowest recovery possible. When you're chest breathing and you've been sick, your body's struggling. It can't get enough air. It's tight. It's going to be anxious up here, feeling like it's never going to have enough. So this mini pause, which is really simple, after you've sneezed, after you've coughed, after you've yawned, anytime, you take a breath in through your nose. Do it for yourself now. Take a breath out at your own pace. And then suspend your breathing for three to five, three to four to five seconds. Just don't take a breath. Feel your body when you breathe in. Just notice where you're breathing from. In my case, always, it always feels like I get lower down right away. I've been talking a little bit, a lot. So I've been a little up here, just doing the mini pause. I'm back down. So then you feel that? You hit, see your head shaking? Yeah, great. Yeah, it's great. And so when you're sick, you want to do this all the time. And like it says here, you can do it 10, 15 minutes before going to bed to reduce congestion but you can do it two, three times a minute if you need to. Every time you cough, no excuses. Cough, do a mini pause. Sneeze, do a mini pause. Especially if you're not feeling well. Get back down to having your breath come from your diaphragm, not from your chest. We'll do more. Okay, questions? Mo Roxanne? I also do this when I'm walking. Like a, when I'm walking up a hill. Uh-huh. Especially, mm -hmm. it helps to maintain, um, um, just maintain my breath. Great. Thank you for that. Suggestion to everybody. Great. Okay, moving right along. So breathing while you're talking. I'm doing the best I can here. I feel like I have a lot of information, so sometimes I get away from myself here, but... I think we said, said it before, but I'll say it again. Mouth breathing, when you, if you saw a bear come in your front door, you're gonna go, ah, and your whole body's gonna be on sympathetic overload. It's gonna be gearing up for fight or flight. Every time you use your mouth for breathing, you trigger that fight or flight. So if I'm talking and I run out of air and I grab a breath from my mouth, I'm increasing my own activation. So the way to really do this properly is when I speak and I feel like and I follow the mandate to um, pace myself so I can always use my nose for breathing. 
when I feel like I run out of air, I close my mouth, take a breath through my nose, and then start talking again. It slows the conversation down, which is really a good thing. It slows your listening down, which is also a good thing. So the information I gave you in the last sentence can be more assimilated. And actually in my slowing down pace, I'm no longer thinking about what I'm gonna say, I'm just trusting that the words I need to say in this moment are coming to me. But this practice of nose breathing and following movement really over time develops a sense of friendship with your own breathing. You wanna know how breathing behaves in your body and how your physiology behaves based on your breathing behavior. Behavior, breathing is a behavior when it's not being allowed automatically. And even when it's allowed, it's, it's a behavior. So when I do this talking piece, what I find really fascinating about it when I do it well is when I stop to breathe for myself, and I take all my awareness and I follow the movement of breath into my body and the movement of my body in response to the air coming in, I get a point where I know I've received enough. I know what enough is enough is and then I can start talking again. But more importantly for me is that when I do that, I'm taking my attention away from you for a moment. You're still in my field, but I'm paying attention to me. And now I come back and pay attention to you. So I'm balancing that reality of back and forth and it keeps me more even that way. So I'm not you know, way out here giving information, giving information and sort of losing myself in it. I have a moment where I can come back to myself. So I'll do it, practice it more as we go along right now. So good practice to develop. And I'll just give you this little caveat for the women out there. Most of the comments that come back when I teach this is, but if I stop talking for a minute, I'm going to get interrupted. That's usually the comment. So I always give them the second part of that, then I'll tell you the lesson I learned from my wife. I'm not done talking. Oh, excuse me. So a moment of self-responsibility. <laughs> Okay, practice that. Raise your hand to talk. I want you to do it this way now. All right, here's another thing. Since I mentioned that breathing is a behavior, you want to notice when you use your mouth for breathing. Make a list, simple. Once you start noticing it, you go, oh, wait a minute, I'm about to do that, I'm about to do that thing that I always do when I open my mouth to breathe. Let me take a moment to get conscious. So my number one on the list, there were two number ones on the list for me. One was getting out of my car. I don't know what happened. I breathe, nose breathe fine. Turn the car off, take the key out, open the door, open my mouth to breathe. I don't know. Second one was going out to get mail in the mailbox. I had this huge fear of the mailbox. Like, so my whole world's gonna change. It was so controlling that I felt like I didn't want to need anything coming in from the outside. I learned to stop that and I learned to stop worrying about the mailbox too. So make a list. Some of the common ones are brushing your teeth, taking a shower, eating, drinking, talking, but you'll all find your own little quirky place in the world where you open your mouth to breathe. Just learn how to keep it quiet, to keep it shut. And you, can, you can even smile with your mouth closed. Right, Roxanne? Okay, so we need a supportive posture to help reduce airway resistance. This is really important. So, so part of why I did the, this person here in the body checklist, this is from a book called Jaws, by the way, which is really, if you're interested in breathing and in how to, how to breathe and how, what the mouth is supposed to do and the teeth is supposed to do and the tongue is supposed to do, can't recommend this book highly enough. This woman who wrote the book along with an environmental biologist talks about that malocclusion of the teeth is also a pandemic and that really interferes with, um, with breathing later in life. And if, um, so sitting in a good position. And if you're lying down, I thought I had a slide in here. If you're lying down, you wanna have your knees bent so you're not lying flat. When you lie flat on your back, 
you lose 90 uh, not 40% of your lung function because your um, your um, organs move towards the diaphragm makes the diaphragm harder to move so so just take a moment to see what I was speaking to before. Just breathe through your nose, put your hand on your chest and your belly. And notice which hand moves first when you nose breathe and you're sitting in a good position. And just notice the state of your nervous system, whether you're relaxed, whether you're calm, just make a you know, gradient in your mind about that. And then open your mouth to breathe and just take a breath or two through your mouth. Notice where the breath moves to and notice the state of your nervous system. See if it changes. Some people it does, some people it doesn't. Go back to nose breathing and see what happens. So can you tell your system gets a little activated when you open your mouth to breathe? Just shake your head yes or no. You're still doing it. And you also notice it kind of moves to the chest rather than the uh, belly. Yeah, And that's functional if you're actually running away from somebody. You have bigger alveoli in your chest. You can move more air quickly if you're really, if you're really running. Because you're also running and you're also producing more blood gases. So it balances itself out. But if you're doing it just from sitting, very unsettling, so another reason. All right, so this is my way of teaching you how to let your body breathe you and get your will out of how to breathe so that you're not breathing, but your body is breathing you. And this really reduces airway resistance. So to start this off, just to have a baseline of something that's different, just take a normal breath through your nose, and just notice if there's sound, either, either on the in or the out. And notice how much of your intention is engaged in taking air in. Are you actually, you know, willfully breathing air in? Like you're in the active process. You, as you know yourself, to do something in an activity, in active in the process. Just notice that. Then for the next couple of breaths, you're thinking this. You're not saying it aloud. You're just thinking the syllable sa. So you'll hear it in your head because when you think something, you hear it. And just notice the flow of air. Are you still involved with your will? Does your chest and torso open up for air? Unlike when you are willfully breathing air in, when you're pulling, do you feel a tightening in your chest when you're pulling? And when you're doing saw, you feel like your whole body's opening to receive the gift of the breath. And then you can do ha on the way out so that you get a sense of the lungs put it in, lungs drew the air in, so now let them use their contractile ability to squeeze the air out along with the diaphragm pushing up into the lungs. This is my favorite thing to do. And what it's trained me is I don't have to do sun. Uh, I can automatically, if I find myself working too hard to breathe, just make the switch. And the pleasure of feeling my body just open and the air come in without any effort. And so my body's breathing me, my lungs are breathing air in. And I'm glad to give the job over to the lungs because they now have more intelligence than I do about how much breath I should take in or not. So Rebecca, this would be really great for you. Get out of any stress. Just let the body breathe you. Sit on a chair. Promise your lungs you're taking care of them now. They've taken care of you. You take care of them by letting them do the breathing and knowing how much effort they need to put into it. The Saha, really good for slowing the breath down and reducing any resistance, which is we don't want resistance because resistance is effort. And we don't need effort in our own breathing. Don't you just love it? Jennifer's smiling. Leela's smiling. Lori's smiling. Rebecca's smiling. Hey, any questions on this? This is a good act. This is a good. This is a good practice. It's so simple. I got it from Swami Rama in a book called The Art of Breathing, and it doesn't have religious significance. It's just two syllables, even though it was done by a Swami. 
but it's been around for a long time. It's also in the Radiant Sutras, which is 5,000 years old. Yeah, Roxanne. When I first started doing this, I was breathing more in the front of my body. So I was breathing like in the front of my nose and, and more into the front of my lungs. Right. It wasn't so, it, what really made it work is when I visualized the breath going into the back of my head and the back of my lungs. That really just opened my breath up in a whole new way using, using the sa and the ha. Great. Great to add the visualization. I just like the sensate way with it way of it. The other thing that's really amazing by the Saha is I'm going to go back to this picture here. This picture of the Kanke. There's a there's an inferior hole, there's a middle hole, and there's an upper airway hole. You can see this one is the narrowest. In this area here is the biggest and then this one down here. When we are willfully breathing and we have a habit of breathing, we may breathe more lower where our nostrils fly, or we may try to breathe higher, which means it's gonna get less air because it's a smaller opening. And the interesting thing is that, and I know this from the yoga world and from other scientific information, that when we breathe in through the bottom one predominantly, it triggers the instinctual brain, the brain stem. So sometimes when we see people being angry, we see the nostrils flare, and so they're feeding that instinctual you know, animal response by triggering that part of their brain through their breathing. When somebody's in a blissful state you know, up here, you often see them lifting up. That's the upper nose. The one in the middle is for the heart. And so that opens the heart. So when you do saha and you let the lungs pull the air through, it's going to pull it through all three openings. So you're going to get an you're going to get a synchronicity and coherence of tuning of your instinctual brain, your heart, and your cognitive brain. I like that, and you can play with that on your own by trying to isolate and feel into what you notice gets opened up in you. Uh, but saha opens up all three, and so you are a walking wholeness. I like that. I never said that before. Okay. So take that away. Use it. Practice it so that you really know how to go. Let your lungs do the breathing. Let your body breathe you instead of you breathing your body. So some of you who know that experience of letting your body breathe you when you've done yoga or other kinds of exercises where you're really relaxed and the tension's out of your body and you're lying on the floor and you realize, I'm not even breathing. Right, you're not breathing, your body's breathing you. And it goes at a much slower rate when it's a lot less tension. Great, any questions? Along with that, you want the tongue at the roof of your mouth, not at the bottom. Because this completes the uh, two things happening. One, from an esoteric viewpoint, from a Taoist perspective, the tongue at the roof of the mouth connects the sky energy from the earth energy which comes in at the body right at the roof of the mouth with the tongue there you marry the two and you complete what's called the microcosmic orbit your body is in wholeness you move the tongue away you can actually feel a disconnect from that orbit but to come back whoa i'm hooked in you're in the orbit so the other important piece about it is so here's a picture where the tongue is just, here's the hard palate, this lighter color, and the tongue is just, just moving right along. Not, not possible for everybody. We're born with the possibility, but if we've been having bad breathing habits with the tongue in the wrong place, our teeth will be narrowed. We won't be able to get the tongue up, up in between our teeth, which is where it's supposed to be. You can feel that if you say the word ek. You can feel the tongue move up to the bottom, back. So you do your best job to keep your tongue up there, and you just want to notice this airway space. Of course, this is a drawing, but nonetheless, nice open airway space. You move the tongue down from the hard palate, down here, then it narrows the airway space. So you have less airway space. Keeping the tongue there opens the airway space. You can play with that. Drop the tongue down. Notice it feels a little constricted. So another thing to keep noticing and practicing. So as you do Saha, put your tongue in the right place, give yourself the best chance. Just remember, don't sleep on your back. 
sleep on your side. Back is the worst place for sleeping for airway. All that, all that teeth and tongue stuff drops back in, occludes the airway. So this is a, just a picture to show you what happens when you grow up with not having your tongue in the right position like this mom did and this dad did by being overly tight. And this daughter spent years in learning uh, orofacial myofunction in the proper placement of the tongue and the teeth. And so she developed what most people would call a perfect face in that way. But this is what happens when you mouth breathe and have your tongue. Even if you keep your teeth wide apart and your mouth closed, it's still gonna distort your face. As you can see with me, if I open my mouth, when I keep my mouth closed inside my lips, I lengthen. But if I keep my teeth connected, there's more of a chance of being happy. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so this is a really good exercise to do. I'm gonna take you through this. This is not gonna be in your thing. This is a hyperventilation reduction exercise. This is great. Rebecca, you need to pay close attention to this uh, too if you don't have this. Sometimes, you know, you sit down to want to meditate and your mind is going a mile a minute or you sit down to want to relax and you notice your mind's going a mile a minute. You just want to see what your breath is doing. It's moving really quickly. It just seems like there's nothing you can do in your, with your skills to know how to bring your breath into compliance, to slow down, to give you a better opportunity. So the important thing to read here is if you're hyperventilating with anxiety or worry or concern, you only do this to the count of six. And you'll understand what that means in a minute. But if you have asthma, what you're really trying to do is really open your airway. And carbon dioxide is a bronchial dilator. So by increasing your carbon dioxide levels through breath holding, you're going to be able to soften the smooth muscle around the bronchi because it also is a dilator for that, and also open the airways. So, but if you can't get to the, I'm gonna say this, if you're struggling, like maybe you are, uh, anybody here, Rebecca, if you can't get to the count of 10, that's okay, just go to the count of eight and go backwards. So basically what you're doing, and I'm gonna, we're gonna do this together, is you're gonna breathe in for two seconds, and then out for three seconds, and then you're gonna pause for two seconds, and then you're gonna repeat by breathing in for two seconds, and out for three seconds, and then you're gonna hold for three seconds. So you're gonna build a sequence where you hold for three, you hold for four, you hold for five, you hold for six, and then you come back from six to five, to four, to three, to two. If you're doing it for asthma, you go to seven, you go to eight, you go to nine, you go to 10, then nine, eight, seven, six, all the way back. And I promise you, I know this from being an asthmatic, I know this from using this when I haven't had an inhaler and then call without an inhaler that it feels like I'm gonna die on the way up. But on the way down and the airway opens, it's like, oh my God, thank you. The airways are back and opening again. There's such relief in it in that moment. So somebody's gonna be knocking at the door outside, which means my dog's gonna bark. So bear with me here. All right, you ready to try this together? 81 seconds. I brought people out of severe panic attacks in 81 seconds doing this one up to six. Fabulous little exercise. Trust me, it works. Rebecca, I'm going to only go to six tonight, but on your own, you can do it up to 10 if you try it, okay? To see how six makes you feel. Are you ready? Everybody ready? So take a breath in. Take a breath out. And suspend. One, two. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two, three. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two, three, four. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two, three, four, five. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two, three, four, five, six. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend, one, two, three, four, five. Breath in, breath out. Suspend, one, two, three, 
four. Breath in, breath out. Spend one, two, three. Breath in, breath out. Spend one, two. Breath in, breath out. That actually 84 seconds, but feeling a little more, rela more relaxed. You may have been relaxed before, but feels like it's serviceable. Yes, yes, no, no. Thank you, thank you. It's a, you know, it might have been a little fast for some of you. If you note that and say, well, that was a little fast for me. I don't usually breathe that fast. Remember, this is supposed to be done when you are breathing really fast and you're trying to slow it down. So um, you can also extend that exhale to four seconds if it feels a little fast or five seconds. But it's to be used when you're having trouble catching your breath. So uh, another tip from Roxanne, uh, it can be done going after you've gone uphill or when you're walking and you feel like out of breath, it's a little longer exercise. But really it helps you condition your breathing so that if you find yourself walking or doing exercise and you need to slow down, catch your breath so you can continue to breathe through the nose, you can do this right in the middle of exercise. Rebecca, did it help you at all? Uh, it did. Um, I'd feel a little lightheaded though from all the, all of everything. Okay. So just yeah, you know, just see if you can just let it all slow down a little bit. Yeah, Leela. And um, I have a question. Can we breathe out through your mouth? If you're sometimes I can't get enough air out through my nose. I, I don't have trouble breathing in through my nose, but sometimes I need to exhale through my mouth. Well, I think you can do that until you really get a sense of letting the air leave your nose. I mean, that may be because you're not giving your exhale enough chance to really settle out and lengthen itself until it's really complete. Sometimes, I mean, a lot of people, um, I don't mean to use that superlative, but there is a lot of people, they, they abort their exhale too early and they're always gasping. They feel like they can't, so they can't get enough air, they can't get enough air out. The problem with breathing out through your mouth is then you're giving off too much carbon dioxide. The body, carbon dioxide, the pop, carbon dioxide is a major hormone of the body. It's a regulator, it's not a waste gas. And so we have to look at the fact that, you know, atmospheric change in gases, blood changes in gases. When you breathe out through your nose, the load of carbon dioxide that's being released, two thirds of that load stay in your sinuses and your nose. So when you breathe back, you breathe back that part of your carbon dioxide that's gonna feed your system. Sort of like breathing into a paper bag if you faint, if you're about to faint. If you breathe out through your mouth, you deep get the whole load out. For every 1% decrease in the carbon dioxide load in your body is a 2% decrease in the flow of oxygen. Three big breaths out of the mouth is a 7% is a decrease in oxygen, is in carbon dioxide, the load in the body is a 14% decrease in the flow of oxygen. And that therein lies the myth of deep breathing. Breathe in, breathe out through your mouth. You do that three times, you go, yeah, I'm really relaxed. And next thing you know, you're actually anxious again, real quickly. It doesn't settle the system at all, because now it's oxygen starved. So I say no in the long run, just getting used to. The biggest thing about breathing out and the hardest thing to, um, I think for me it was very difficult, is to allow my exhale to leave on its own. I just breathe in, I just soften, I just follow the softening of my body into the support and let my breath just leave my body. The lungs are doing the contracting, the diaphragm's doing the pushing and the blood gas ratio to the atmosphere is pulling the air out of my body. And I'm waiting until that feels finished and satisfied. And that breathing come in. I had a question. Sure, Laura. Um, what, do you, what do you think about just hanging out there on the longer part of that exercise? You know, just staying in the six to 10 for a while to just let the body really relax into that instead of going back down right away. Oh no, go right back down. Because if you, you, want to, you want your breath, from my viewpoint, you want your breath to normalize. Once it gets back down and you've actually helped it relax by um, balancing those blood gases a little bit, 
the breathing rate should slow down to its natural, normal level. Because what can happen, and I've had this happen, and I was taught this, and I had the experience of it, of running up some stairs and hyperventilating, doing that exercise, and not really getting fully complete with it, and taking a breath back in through my mouth really quickly, I was right back into hyperventilating. It just was instantaneous. So if you hang out in the exhale, and the, and the pause too long, just in this exercise alone, you may end up gasping for air. There are other particular exercises where we hold our breath longer, but this, for this exercise, I suggest just doing it the way it's given. It's just given. Okay, thanks. And for the purpose that it's given for, which is to get your breath under control. Because if you want to get, once it's under control, you may be and then able to do a little saha, and you may be able to do a little um, more quiet breathing once it's back under control. Okay. And it's great in exercise too. My wife used it to improve her bicycling. That when she was um, riding and couldn't keep up and she started to mouth breathe, she would do this exercise, slow down, um, just do it quietly pedaling. And then when she got her breath back, she would pick up. And in a couple of weeks, she was keeping up with the people she could no longer keep up with and could only breathe through her nose instead. Because it was only breathing through her nose. So let's do, a, let's do an, a, another, Roxanne. Just one more thing on the exhale. You kind of said this by letting yourself soften in the exhale, but I found that I had to. I've had. I have to. My my diaphragm tightens on the exhale, so I have to consciously work with my diaphragm to allow it to soften. It doesn't just soften on its own. So just wanted to mention that that just really allowing because the exhale can't happen if the diaphragm is tight. Well, the diaphragm is contracting in the exhale. It's, it's coming back up towards the lungs. It's, it's meant to contract and push up into the lungs to push the air out of the lungs. So it is doing some contracting. Well, I'm just saying mine doesn't naturally contract because I'm holding it. Oh, I see. I see. I can't. I mean, I have to let go of the tension in order to let it go back into its relaxed state, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it does. Thank you. So let's do this. Let's just do, um, we didn't fully, uh, I want to go back to doing another, another five minute piece. So let's get yourself in a good position. This is where uh, I want to add some pieces in here that I, that I didn't mention in the first um, meditation. We're coming to the end. We have about nine minutes left. So let's take about five minutes. So sitting in that position or in a position that makes you comfortable. You should breathe in and out and you could use saw and hop. Just want you to notice how you are receiving support from underneath you. So however it is that you are receiving support, I want you to keep the sensations of support and your awareness of receiving support in your awareness as you inhale. So you breathe in, you breathe out, you notice how your body softens, you notice where the support feels. You keep that awareness of support and you breathe in. And notice if you can that breath, the body is moving with breath from support, where you registered the support is where breath feels like it's moving. So I'm going to say this in another way to help articulate myself. You bring home home at night, you put your car in the garage, you don't look for your car out in the street in the morning. It's the same thing with breath. You leave your breath off in your body and you let it where it lands most heavily in support. So that when you breathe in, you're breathing in with an awareness of support. So breath is arising from a supported place and actually moves the bottom of your body first. So each time you exhale, you may deepen that sense of relaxation and rest into support. This is how you rest your body into being held. And when it's being held, it has more of a chance to be nourished. And the nourishment comes in the feeling of the ease of the inhale.
You want to learn how to rest your body. The exhale will take you to teach you how to let yourself receive support. It'll, it'll automatically light up in your awareness. If you're lying down, you may feel it in your back, in your legs, in your heels, in your head. Just, you just follow where in your awareness support shows up. And then just breathe with that in your with that support in your awareness. You don't have to breathe into anything, even with pain. You breathe with sensations. And just notice on each exhale, you may see now this is moving away a little bit from support, staying with noticing, but noticing other sensations that may light up in your body as you as you exhale. Other location. It's the same concept. It may be your shoulders. Your may, shoulders may be wanting to relax into the support. So whatever sensation lights up anywhere in your body, you keep it in your awareness as you inhale. And you notice the movement in that place that you put your awareness. And then in the next exhale, you see is it the same place or is there a new location that is lighting up in awareness? And if there is, you breathe with that. And I hope for you would be eventually that you would start to notice more of your body is breathing and moving with each breath. So your body is drawing your attention through sensation, whether they're pleasant or not. And it's asking for and longing for the movement of breath to touch it. So by being aware of it, breath follows awareness, and that's where breath will go. And as you get quieter, you may notice your heartbeat. You may want to find your heartbeat on the pulse and keep your heartbeat in your awareness while you breathe in if it shows up. Take another minute. And I want to ask yourself, and ask your breath, what is it I want, what is it I'm meant to learn right now about my breathing that I didn't know before? Just ask the question. And letting your eyes take a little sips of light before you open them fully, just to kind of let your body adjust to some visual stimulus. Visual stimulus will change your breathing.
Wonderful, thank you. One second, Laurie. When you get these, you'll see this um, little chart about what kind of masking, what kind of filters you can get that will um, keep your house safe. Especially silver ones with silver filters, they, they can kill viruses, so you need to look for those. And just this last slide, this will show you that even when you exercise, you can keep your mouth closed. Woman on the right, Pateco star, she learned Pateco. I don't know what the swimmer on the right did, but even though I was breathing. And there'll be resources and also more information also available when you get the slides about nose breathing and not how much to watch. So we're coming to the end. Laura, you want to say something? Hold it, Laura. You got to unmute you. Sorry. Go ahead. You're unmuted now. It's good. Okay. I wanted to thank you first. This is very useful. Um, right. The other thing is with the coronavirus, there's yeah. something going around about testing yourself like breathing in and holding your breath and if you could do it for 10 seconds without coughing or your body tensing you probably don't have it some say that's false but i know that if you're really sick holding for 10 seconds is not easy you know with the lung capacity so any thoughts about that yeah i have heard that i have uh, i've tried it i don't cough but in, in, in the Teco, we measure the health of breathing, and you can find a lot of this online, something called the control pause, where you breathe in um, for two seconds, you breathe out for two or three seconds, and then you pinch your nose at the end of that exhale. And um, there's a chart, you know, anything above uh, 20, 21, 22, 23 is good. Anything below that, 15 is, is you know, getting to be dangerous. If you're in the low fives threes sevens then you need then you so need control pause is much better gauge of that I, than doing I, what they were talking about i think so yeah. i mean we've we've especially somebody uh like um who has asthma i mean people tend to be hyperinflated already in their lung mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. hyperinflation uh, destroys the um elasticity of the lungs so let's put more of that elasticity and stress on it and more than likely, you're going to take a big breath afterwards. So if you just uh, learn the control boys, which is to mm. breathe, breathe out whole yeah. when you feel a slight urge to breathe. And it's really amazing because I was in Seattle many, many years ago trying to figure out whether I wanted to move here. And I woke up one morning. My control pose was usually in the mid-30s, high 30s. And I woke up one morning and I coughed. I thought, whoa, my lungs are wet. And I took my control pose right away, and they were seven. I thought, well, I'm, I'm in trouble. And so that's seven, according to Pateko, is get yourself to the hospital immediately. And I have a version of hospitals. So I thought, well, okay, well, wait a minute. I'll do some Pateko practice this 15 minutes and see how I do. So it was 15 after 15 minutes. I thought, okay, I'm going to stay home. But I spent two days in bed with my mouth taped closed, doing just quiet breathing for two days. And I was feeling better afterwards. Did I have pneumonia? I don't know, but my lungs were definitely wet. Mm -hmm. So Rebecca, what number are you getting there? She's still got her nose closed. What number did you get, Rebecca? Um, somewhere in the mid 20s. Oh, good. Good. So, this time together here has been helpful. Do you feel any easier in your lungs right now? I do feel more open, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's all about doing these exercises and staying quiet. Like when you're in that kind of place, you just got to be as quiet as you possibly can be. That was that was that was something that I did learn myself the last time I got sick, which was many years ago. And I said, "Oh my God, you know, I got to take care of my lungs. They've been taking care of me without me noticing, and I got to take care of them. So just stay quiet and be quiet. And don't use my mouth for breathing." Okay, well, this has been enjoyable for me. I hope it was good for you. <laughs> any questions? Any last minute questions? Any any comments? I really appreciate you staying on screen and being here. I, I wanted to offer one comment to um, is it Lila about the exhale, because I also found for years doing Bateco that I couldn't slow my exhale. And uh, then when I stopped measuring it for a few years, it did slow down. I think I was um, too concentrated maybe on trying to do it precisely. Mm -hmm. And I think I also had some breathing exercises where yeah. Any rate, humming, humming, you know, just humming also helped me extend my pause. Humming's great. I mean, not my, not my pause, my oh, yeah. exhale. 
And humming is great because it produces nitric oxide, which helps them dilate. So Rebecca, uh, a caution, don't keep doing it. Do it once, if you, you know, maybe you want to check in once or twice a day, but if you keep doing it um, because you want a good number or you're just worried about it, it can raise your blood pressure. So be really careful about that. You don't, you don't do it constantly throughout the day. If you do some exercises and you feel like you've been really resting and you want to measure, okay. But just to kind of, am I okay? Am I okay? Just don't, don't get that. Don't get involved with that way. It can really uh, raise your blood pressure. It's not good. Um, that's why, Laura, I really like the Saha. I put my lungs back in charge. And I also really, I mean, those are the things that are most important to me. The fact of support from gravity, that I really allow myself to, be, to rest and be held. And when I can do that, my body just starts to trust that I'm taking care of it and it begins to open and begins to breathe easier and find the breath it needs. Take a bigger breath if it needs it, then slow it down. And more, the more of my body that actually moves with breath, the less I have to breathe. Because what drives breathing is tension. Tension is twofold. One is that it needs a lot of energy to keep it running, so it needs a lot of oxygen for that. And tension um, limits the capacity of our breathing to move into space. It keeps everything tight. It's a way that we may, our breath is being held. It's being held captive in a small space from tension. So the more I can trust gravity and the more I can find that um, I can, uh, I also am comfortable with the sense of being buoyant, then I'm in a relationship with those two forces that are the primary forces for our life on earth, which is the gravitational pull downward, which everybody is subject to, and the other force of gravity, which is that it provides a lift. So it goes down and up. And as all basketball player knows, to make a jump shot, you got to go down before you can go up. And so it's same with the breath. The breath has to really drop down to its bottom place and really get comfortable with allowing the exhale to finish itself beyond where you think it might be done. So breath can arise from the depths, not as a deep breath, but from the depths of the body is where breath arrives from. It's primary, it's cellular, it comes from the depths. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's a whole other conversation, but we're well in there right now. Can I ask you something quick or? Please, Corey, I'm, oh. I'm actually willing to hang out. I don't really oh, great. I yeah, did say it was an hour and a half, so it's fine. Yes, well, I, I just noticed there's something that you taught us quite a while ago that I use all the time when I'm afraid I'm getting sick. Mm. And that's the thing with the 100 toothpicks, where you do 30 minutes of breathing and then you're holding for three to five seconds and then regular breathing. And I tell you, within about 10 or 15 minutes, I think, okay, I'm yeah. a goner now. And it turns around and I do the, the nasal stuff too and I do not get sick. And right now is such an important time to do that because of thinking, uh-oh, am I getting, you know, the thing, the virus. So do you, could you include that maybe? Yeah, with mind, you, thanks for me. Because it's so good. It's just been, I teach it to my clients. It's just fantastic. Well, it was the mini pause that I turned, 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 turned earlier. Yes, and but more of a, a 30 minutes of it. It was like doing it 100 yeah. times in a day. Right, when right, you feel, right. When you're feeling sick. And so yeah. the, the way to keep them was get 100 toothpicks out. Right. And every time you do one, you move the toothpick to the other column. And so that you can see that you've done 100 times right. a day. Yeah, so thanks for that. So effective. It's yeah. just like my secret weapon sort of thing. So, <laughs> so I wanted other people to know about it if they didn't. Yeah, yeah. So doing 100, 100 mini pauses been in a day. So that's a good one for, for anybody who's not feeling well and who has asthma to keep doing that. Because it keeps reminding the body to stay down low. Don't get caught breathing up here when you don't feel well and you're getting anxious. The last thing you want is the energy to move upward and get caught in your chest breathing. So but I've had it people... It turns, it, it's like I start feeling a sore throat and the nasal thing. And I swear, I do it 30 minutes in a row. I do like 90 breaths, you know, 30, okay. uh, uh, or the, uh, 100 breaths in 30 minutes. Wow. Um, the, and it, it's like the sore throat literally starts to go away. I mean, it's so powerful. Anyway, I don't want to take it. No, no, I'm really glad Fantastic. you did that. Fantastic. Like, I can't be... thank you enough for that one. <laughs> well, what you're speaking yeah. to is it's a real immune booster. Um, yes. That, that, you're, that you're rebalancing your blood gases so that you have a real clear 
um, balance of so the big issue that we haven't really gone into depth is you need a certain level of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream to balance the pH of the blood. When the balance of the pH of the blood is, is balanced, um, then oxygen flows freely from the hemoglobin in the red blood cells out to the other cells. When CO2 level levels are off, the blood can become too acidic or too alkaline, and that mm. just inhibits the flow of oxygen immediately. And it doesn't take but one breath to disrupt the blood gases, but to bring it back like you're talking about, it's a very powerful tool to bring back the carbon dioxide levels to normal and uh, release the oxygen and boost the immune system. So great. Thanks for a reminder of that. Yeah, no, it's about 90 breaths, I guess, for the minute, but fantastic stuff. Thank you. All right, good. Yeah. You should write that up. <laughs> Send it to me. Anything else? I'm happy to do it. All right, good. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. So here's my request from all of you. One of the things, I'm just going to put this aside. One of the things that has disturbed me, and I'm trying to get it out there, I've written to Amy Goodman and to NPR, is that in all, in that in all of the ways that they're telling people to take care of themselves, no one is talking about breathing in the public media about how it's important to have to take care of your breathing when you're not feeling well. And I think that information needs to get out. I think the taker practitioners need to be interviewed. And so if anybody has any connections to say, listen, there's resources out here that aren't being talked about, pass the word along, even if it's not me, I don't care. It's just, it's just a crime. It's the major thing we need to know about. This is why I started doing this, to get people. And so please, yeah. you know, last week's is now posted on my YouTube channel, The Breathable Body, so it's free up there now. Uh, this one was a little different, but uh, I'll give it another week and then I'll probably put this one up also. It feels right to let people have access to this. And I appreciate your support in it. Uh, it keeps me going as well, so I really appreciate that. Anything else? All right, then I bid you, I bid you good well in the uh, voice of Dr. Robert Fried, who is a breathing specialist. Breathe well, be well. Thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take good care, everybody. Nobody gets sick. Bye.